this is Kurt Davis with Real Estate Wealth Coaching, and I want to thank everybody who has taken the time tonight to jump on our Zoom meetup. This is our November meetup, and it's actually our last meetup uh, of this year. We're not going to do it in December, uh, obviously, because when we normally schedule these, it's around the holidays. So we do not want to schedule a meeting for the month of December. We will be back in January, though, so uh, stay tuned for what we have planned for January. Uh, if you're not following us, make sure you are on Facebook, Instagram, Meetup. Uh, those are some areas where you can follow us. Uh, we're very active on our Facebook page. Uh, the Meetups, obviously, we use for promoting events like we are tonight. Uh, make sure that you also check us out on our YouTube page. We put out tons of great uh, content. There's training videos. There's interviews. Uh, we even have actual videos of uh, students doing uh, real estate deals, transactions. I've got flips on there that I'm doing as well, too. So make sure you follow us on YouTube. Tonight's sponsor is Avalon Capital. And Avalon Capital is a, they're actually a local company here, but it's a private lending company. And I, I listed some of the loan terms, as you can see right there, five points loan origination, 1% a month is interest only, six month terms. These are asset based loans. So it has nothing to do with your credit. Uh, if you find a good deal, there's a, a high probability that you could get what's considered a 100% loan if the purchase and rehab combined fall into that 70 to 80% loan to value range. Uh, you can follow Avalon Capital on Facebook, backslash Avalon Capital LLC. And if anybody's ever looking for a loan through Avalon, as of right now, you can uh, connect with them through the Facebook page, or you can go to realestatewealthcoaching.com backslash private lending and fill out a basic application, which gets forwarded right to Craig Jennings over at Avalon Capital. Uh, we are also looking for at buying property. So if anybody out there is wholesaling, uh, come across any deals, we can pay cash, close fast. There's a list of all the zip codes uh, that we're in. We're also doing North Mississippi as well. Uh, ideally, we're looking for three bedroom, one bathroom homes or greater. Uh, we'll look at two beds as long as they're in premium areas like Midtown Cooper Young or Colonial Acres. Uh, and there's my contact information. So in the event that you get something, I'd love for you to forward it on to me to take a look at. All right. So tonight, tonight we're going to be talking with Dennis McDaniel and he is going to share with us uh, some strategies on how to essentially start, build, and scale a real estate business. And we will be getting to, to that portion here. We're actually going to get this meeting kicked off here. I'm going to drop out of here and uh, get rid of the share screen here in a minute. All right. All right, Dennis, you can hear me loud and clear. Yes, sir. Loud and clear. All right, buddy. Well, listen, I, I know... I know you're busy and I know that we were trying to fit you in in October, but uh, you had a little case of the having a baby happening in October. So uh, we had to let you do that instead. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I, I apologize that uh, Tommy got delayed a little bit, but uh, as life would have it, uh, we welcomed a precious little one into the world. And so unfortunately that took a little bit of my time up there. Little daddy daycare action happening. Man, let me tell you what, right now that's exactly what's going on. But uh, hey, I'm, I'm actually blessed that my business operates whether I'm in the office or not. And so I haven't been in the office um, maybe twice in the last month. So because um, Annalise is a month old now. Yeah, awesome. Uh, well, we're going to get this meeting started. I've got, I've got a list of questions that we're going to hit. And then once we kind of get past these, uh, I guess what you would kind of call standard interview questions, just to kind of familiarize yourself with uh, the people who are on or who will eventually watch this when we post it later, um, we'll get into the, you know, what we kind of call the top three strategies for starting, building and scaling a business. And, you know, for the people who are listening, I'm, I'm kind of leaving this up to Dennis to talk to us about from his perspective on how he sees uh, and scales his business. So I will have zero influence on that portion of the meetup tonight, but um Tell us a little bit about you before you got into real estate. I mean, you were not always a real estate investor, I'm sure. What were you doing before real estate? Tell you know, a little bit about you. Sure. Um, I apologize, guys, uh, ahead of time because my uh, computer started 
acting a little wonky. And so I'm on my phone. So you're going to see a little bit of shakiness on the camera. Uh, and I might even start walking around a little bit because I have a hard time sitting still. Uh, right. So just forgive me ahead of time. Um, but yeah, man, my story is, is um, I guess, just like anybody else's, man. I grew up, uh, let's see, I was born in Munich, Germany. We'll, we'll start We'll start at the very beginning. I was born in Munich, Germany. I uh, came to the United States when I was uh, about a year and a half old. Um, my mother met my uh, stepdad and they got married. Um, I lived in a small town called Jacksonville, Texas, which is a population of about 14,500 people. Um, and we lived in a little trailer house. My mom was a factory worker. My stepdad was a tow truck driver. So, um, you know, we definitely didn't have investing in our background or in our bloodline or anything like that. Um, the, uh, beginnings were humble enough. And, um, you know, when I turned 18, my aspirations in life were to jump into the oil field because that's what people did in the little town that I was in. Uh, in order to you know make any money and, and build something. So um, turned 18 years old, jumped into the oil field and uh, worked into the oil field until 2008 when the crash happened. Well, after the crash happened, obviously the oil and gas industry was affected very hard. And so um, we uh, had to switch gears. And from there, man, I did everything from selling vacuum cleaners to working at the prison, uh, man, all kinds of stuff. So um, I actually started my entrepreneurial journey while I was a diesel mechanic. Um, while I was a diesel mechanic and uh, a traditional mechanic, I worked at a place where they made this like um, prototype uh, vehicle that was part motorcycle, part uh, car type of thing. And it was neat and stuff. But man, I, I just early on realized I was in, let's see, I was 21 at that point. And I realized, man, I, I just don't want to do manual labor for, for the rest of my life. I looked at my peers, you know, that were 50, 60 years old, turning wrenches still. And, um, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with that life. I, I just didn't want to do it for forever. You know, I wanted to be able to save and, and invest and scale uh, some type of business. And I had no clue what that would even look like. And that's so in my desperation. Now, that's fascinating that you, it's fascinating that you say that because when I was... 18 or 19, I used to want to be a auto mechanic. I used to want to work on hot rod muscle cars. Yeah. And I went to Votech school for auto mechanics. And I remember it was a, it was a rough winter because I'm originally from South Dakota. And I remember thinking to myself, man, I don't want to be 35, 45 years old, laying under vehicles, breaking my knuckles and zero yep. degree weather. So I, I know exactly what you're saying. Yep. I mean, I still have a passion for cars. I mean, I, I, I love still, you know, tinkering and, and all that, but, um, I didn't want to do it as uh, a job, you know, I want to do it as a hobby. So, um, as life would have it, man, you know, it, you're faced with a decision at that point. Uh, do you do something about it or you, do you just belly ache and complain and, you know, get cynical and wish the world was better and, uh, you know, blame everybody else for your problems. So, um, what interestingly enough, man, I started listening to um, uh, Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar, Les Brown, Brian Tracy, uh, you know, all those guys. And um, they convinced me that I didn't actually have to have um, the formal education, if you will, to get out and do something in the world if I wanted to, you know, make a make an impact or a change. So. My search uh, began on Craigslist, actually, because I didn't know where else to go uh, to find something. So interestingly enough, I found an ad on Craigslist. Uh, it was like for a um, financial advisory type uh, firm. And uh, everybody told me it was a scam. Uh, you know, don't do it. It's a Craigslist deal. You, you know, nothing will happen from it besides maybe you'll lose some money and some time. Uh, but something urged me to go ahead and... Uh, and, uh, you know, apply. Um, the people responded back, listen, man, you're in a small little town. Uh, there's no potential sales around you and, you know, uh, you got to get insurance licensed and, you know, be able to do, uh, you know, uh, all these different things, these hoops and hurdles that you had to jump through. So, um, I just said, cool, listen, um, I don't know anything about, any of what you're talking about, but I promise you, if you bring me on to your company, I will be the hardest working person that you have on your team. And somehow I convinced them to allow me to join onto their team. 
Um, and, you know, I became one of their youngest regional managers within a uh, pretty short period. Uh, within eight months, I was, I was able, when I went full time, um, I was able to actually open up my own territory. And so that was the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. And man, I worked my butt off and uh, made my first six figures in that company. Um, and uh, man, it taught me a, a lot. Uh, the sales training and aspect really kind of helped me um, transition into real estate. And so um, I sold life insurance and annuities and, and we did some financial stuff for folks, debt elimination and college planning and stuff like that. So um, it was really cool because I built up a book of business of about 130 clients uh, in that business. And so um, the difference with that type of business is that it's, um, it's not very transactional. It's extremely relational. You have to service your clients ongoing for, you know, 20, 30 years. And so, um, it was just a, it was a fun time and I would probably still be with them. Honestly enough, uh, I would be with them still if the company didn't kind of implode, uh, because of their main vendor that they wrote business through decided to sell off their, uh, annuity business and, um, the company kind of collapsed in on itself. And so, um, it was, uh, it was an interesting time, uh, incurred a lot of debt. So through that period, since I was in sales, um, you have what are called chargebacks, which means that if you make a sale uh, to a client, then if they discontinue the service uh, within a 12 to an 18 month period, you actually have to give back all of the commissions that you were paid on that sale. Um, and the crazy thing is I'd already paid taxes on those monies and all that kind of stuff. So I got hit when the company imploded on itself. They couldn't service their business anymore properly. So all the reps in the field, um, I really got clobbered, man. And I got hit with like $30,000 worth of chargebacks. Uh, and then like another $18,000 worth of IRS, um, taxes that, that, you know, they, they tacked on, uh, to that. So it was a, a really crazy time for me. And a buddy of my, well, a guy that I met when I moved to Memphis, um, I had been in Memphis at that point for probably, uh, almost two years, year and a half year and a half uh, I was in Memphis. Um, and you know, Laksh Nandrajog. Um, so he had been bugging me at that point for about a year and a half. Cause I met him on an appointment where he was like, listen, man, I'm not going to buy any of your stupid life insurance products, but, um, you know, you should do real estate cause you'll make a ton of money. You're a great salesman. And he had bugged me. We, we became friends at that point. Um, he had bugged me to get into real estate and man for a year and a half, I was t kept telling him no. Um, and then I called him up one day. I was like, Hey, look, man, uh, I think it's time for me to start doing real estate. And from there, man, we just, uh, we just started rocking and rolling and, and selling houses. I mean, it was pretty cool. So now you get into real estate. So you transition from what you were doing to real estate. And that's, that's interesting that Lax got you in, which I like that guy. Uh, <laughs> when you, so essentially when you first started out in real estate, what were you, what were you doing? Yeah. Good question. What questions. was your start? So, um, you know, I realized very quickly that, um, you know, in order to buy assets, you got to have money. And since I just got saddled with all this debt um, and I still had to live, right, I, uh, I didn't have money tucked back, right? I kind of had to start back from square one. So I was reading on bigger pockets about something called wholesaling. And, um, you know, it, it very much intrigued me because it seemed like it was basic sales. Uh, with the, um, you know, the ability to get homes under contract, flip that contract to an end buyer and be able to make a spread in the middle. Um, so that's exactly what we started doing. And um, I think, uh, you know, that was, I, I wholesaled for the first, exclusively wholesaled for the first two years. So, so essentially your start in real estate was wholesaling and you said it took two years to make something happen from the time that that started. No, 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 no. no. So it, it was, uh, I just wholesaled for a two year period before okay. I jumped into anything else in real estate. What were, um, what were, what were some of those struggles you had during, during the early wholesaling days? Man, to be honest with you, the, the biggest struggle, um, was probably not the same struggle that, that a lot of people face. My biggest struggle was actually not thinking big enough, um, not uh, believing in 
the fact that if I just continue to put money in marketing and things like that, that it will have a, an exponential return for me. So thinking small, I, I think was my biggest problem, man, because I was just dumping all of the money that I made from any wholesale deals. I was dumping that right back into the business. Uh, I wasn't spending any of it. I was living really frugally and um, I was just kind of scared. So I would, I would stash money back uh, for taxes and, and, you know, for living purposes and stuff like that. Um, and I built up a, a decent sized nest egg with wholesaling. But uh, ultimately, when I look back at it, I wish I would have went all in much sooner and just, uh, trusted the process, I guess. Um, when you started wholesaling, how long did it, for, like when it, when I say started wholesaling from the time that let's just keep it simple from the time that you sent out your, I'm going to guess you started out doing direct mail, something like that. Yep. yep from the time mail. that you sent out that direct mail, when did you start seeing success? And I guess success in the terms of, how long did it take for you to actually start completing wholesale transactions? Um, man, again, this is going to be the, the unconventional answer because we started having success immediately. Um, you know, a lot of times, I guess people start in, in the real estate thing and um, I see people kind of not commit fully and I was doing it full time. Lax was doing it full time. So, you know, you had two people doing it full time. Uh, working our butts off. And so, man, we, we saw results immediately. We, um, I, I put every dollar that I had, I think I had a couple thousand bucks, man, to my name and I sold some stuff as well. So, uh, I got, I sold stuff that I didn't need. I got the money that I had. Um, and I just said, look, man, let's put it all into marketing. And yes, we did direct mail. I actually was on bigger pockets, uh, found a guy by the name of Michael Quarles. I don't even yeah. know if he's still doing stuff or not. Um, but I bought his um, like little course that he had, you know, and uh, he said, basically, this is the direct mail pieces you send out. These are the times that you send it out, so on and so forth. And I did exactly that. Um, and so I think with the first month, we had a deal under contract. Now, at, at this stage of your real estate experience, business, whatever you want to call it, uh, you were were you and Latch kind of like official or unofficial partners? Were you just working together? What was that kind of relationship like? Yeah, good question. We were official partners okay. um, because the reality was all I had to bring to the table was mo some marketing dollars that after I sold stuff, I had some marketing dollars to, to put in and a really hard work ethic. Uh, he had real estate background and experience. And so we, we teamed that together. And we just formed a partnership. So actually hometown investment group, uh, he, he and I formed together. And then, uh, when we decided, uh, he wanted to continue to do, um, uh, real estate and I wanted to continue to do real estate, but he wanted to do flips. I wanted to continue wholesaling. And so I just asked him, Hey man, can I buy the company out from you? And he said, sure, let's, let's figure out something that's, uh, you know, that works for the both of us. And so you know, that's, um, that's how we, I transitioned out of a partnership role and then moved into, you know, working directly just by myself. But at that how, time, yes, we were a full-time partnership. How important was it to have somebody, I, you know, cause like you just mentioned that he actually had some experience. He's been in real estate longer than you at the time. How much were you, how much did you necessarily need to maybe rely on him f for help? Like, uh, cause you mentioned that you obviously had success right off the bat how much of that would you attribute to having a partner who had a success there for you? Um, man, I would honestly say that uh, I don't know the percentage, but um, a, a very, a very big part of our early success is um, combining forces with somebody that actually knew what the heck they were doing. Because, you know, I took some, 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 uh, YouTube courses on, on, you know, wholesaling, but I didn't know what the heck I was doing when I was actually talking to a seller about, Hey, I'm going to purchase your house. Right. The other thing was I didn't feel comfortable telling somebody a lie by saying, Hey, I'm going to buy your house. And I didn't have the money to actually buy their house. Right. So, um, having a person that had the financial backing where I could feel comfortable saying, Hey, listen, you know, we really are going to buy your house. Uh, and also having that person that had the real estate experience was absolutely, um, I would not have had success 
had I not joined uh, with somebody that that had that experience and the financial uh, wherewithal to be able to to you know buy properties with me. So I think I will tie that back into mentorship or partnership when you first start out um, is absolutely critical, man. Either you need to pay a mentor uh, and and lock arms with them, find somebody that resonates with you that that you get along with and that has a message that you can really gravitate towards. Um, and then man, just start running full speed or join up with somebody that has the, the things that you lack, the experience and split deals with them. Cause that's all we did is we split the, you know, whatever profits we made or anything, we just split it down the middle. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think a lot, a lot of people don't want to do that because they think, well, I'm going to lose half the money. But the reality is I wouldn't have made nearly the money that I made early on had I not joined forces with somebody and received mentorship and, and, you know, that sort of thing. Now is hometown investment group. Is that still, are you still operating primarily as a wholesaler? Is that still a large percentage of your business? Um, I would say, yeah, I mean, wholesaling is probably the majority of what we do. I just enjoy it really thoroughly. Um, the, uh, the wholesaling model, if done properly, um, for me and my style, um, I just think it's easier, man. It's, it's just easier for me. Uh, we do flips, we buy, we do buy and holds. Um, we're now, uh, about to jump full force into multifamily apartment investing. Um, but yeah, man, wholesaling is just, uh, I guess at this point it's easy for me. And so I, I enjoy it a lot because I get to continue that, that chase. Um, and then also, a big piece of what I'm trying to do in the industry here locally in Memphis is um, take that negative connotation of what wholesaling is like that get rich quick, um, you know, do whatever you got to do to make money mindset. And I really am, am, am trying to eradicate that and show people how to do this thing in a professional manner, because there's, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Absolutely. Now you kind of alluded to it to kind of transition to where I'm going with some of these questions. Um, so how long have you been from that first time when you started wholesaling till now, how long has that been? Uh, that has been a little over four years. Okay. And you are doing some flips now, correct? Absolutely. Yes. Are your flips mainly retail flips or are these more fix and flip to investors or is it both? Um, all retail. Well, I mean, retail. When I say that, I mean, we have done, um, we have sold the flips when we're done to investors, but those are going to be, it depends on the area that we're doing the flip in, Mm -hmm. right? So like if it's a Frasier or, um, you know, a a very turnkey heavy type area, uh, I personally am not doing the turnkey stuff myself. I'm just doing the rehab work and then selling the house. Um, but yeah, we have sold through a turnkey firm before. Okay. Um, do you prefer doing homes that are geared more towards retail clients than some of the lower quality type properties? Do you, do you prefer one way or another? Or does it not matter? Um, you know, it's a very good question. I guess it would really depend on the area and, and um, the product that I'm working with. Right. I personally don't like to tackle big, massive projects. Um, because they take a really long time and they get very capital intensive. Yeah. The, the potential profit can be much higher, but I like to do paint, flooring, roof, HVAC, um, you know, that sort of thing and get in and get out. So, um, I guess there's a, there's a caveat to each one, right? When you're, when you're rehabbing a house to sell to a, um, turnkey style buyer, uh, it's, I feel like it's, easier to sell because you know the subset of buyer that you're working with. Therefore, you know the criteria that they want already. You can fix it up to that criteria. Um, You know the rents. It's just an easier product to move. The downside to that is typically they're in areas where you're not going to make as much money uh, because the the type of house that you're doing that with is going to be, you know, um, a lower end house. So to your your end buyer that if you're putting the house on the market to sell to typically your spreads are higher. Um, but it's also the guarantee. There's never a guarantee, but the, the, um, the idea is those folks are going to be a lot more picky 
and they have to get approved for financing and things like that. So the process is, is longer on the resale. So I guess there's, there's pros and cons to both. And um, I don't know that I very much enjoy one or the other. I actually don't enjoy flipping houses, to be honest with you. I, uh, mm. I find it to be extremely tedious. You got to babysit contractors and um, you know, you, you got to do a lot to flip a house. I think people uh, make it seem a lot more sexy than what it is. And, and you know, man, yeah. You, yeah. you know, all the stuff that goes into flipping homes, man. It's not nearly as sexy as people make it seem. No, there's, there's, there's a, there's a lot of hurdles to jump through, you know, uh, and I, and, you know, to add to that, you know, if, if wholesaling, if a wholesaler can find a smoking deal, uh, they can still make uh, a fantastic profit. Absolutely. And in a lot of times, you know, I, you, cause I've been doing this for a long time and, and dealing with wholesalers and buying homes from them, man, I'll tell you, sometimes the wholesale spreads that we've, we've seen, uh, are right up there with what we're projected to make on a turnkey flip. And even if it wasn't as much as where we're normally at, sometimes, man, it's like, it's better to, to take less to be done now. And otherwise you have to worry about theft and holding cost and contractors and the investor itself who's buying the property. And I mean, just, just, yeah, there's a lot that really goes into it. So I agree a hundred percent. And one thing I will add to that, man, is my personal business model is if I can't make double on a flip, what I would on a wholesale deal, I just wholesale it out. It's just, it's much easier, man. Talk about um, buy and hold strategies. Now you, you do have homes that you own personally for long-term cash flow. Sure do. Yeah, absolutely. Can I ask how many do you have? Yes. So at this point I have six. Um, I've sold some off because I am transitioning now from the single family side over to the buy and hold on the multifamily side. Gotcha. Now, and those were all, those were single families that you started out with? Correct. And was what type of strategy did, did you do the typical Burr strategy when you purchased them? Actually, I didn't, man. Um, no. I couldn't find a bank here locally that that wanted to mess with me. So um, Sorry, I was I, now I say that I didn't um, I didn't go and spend a bunch of time meeting with bankers. Uh, mm-hmm. But the ones that I did speak with and the ones that I did call, the uh, unfortunate side was I didn't have a W-2 job. Right. So when you don't have a W-2, it's much harder to get uh, the, the financing from a bank than it is if you're you know, self-employed 1099 um, because you have this balance where you have to um, at least the way that I do it. I spend a lot of money in marketing and, and systems and processes and, and things like that for my business. So there's always this balance where you've got to uh, how much income do you want to actually uh, uh, keep and how much do you want to invest back into the business? So I was investing most of it back into the business. So it didn't look like we were very profitable. Yeah. Even though you were making uh, plenty enough money on That's paper, right. you, on paper, I, I, I get how the CPAs do it. They yep. make it look, make it look like you're broke. Yep, exactly. Right. So, so that was, that's the downside. Uh, so I did not do the traditional Burr method. I actually saved up money and my strategy was to buy, uh, houses under $30,000, uh, do a reno to it. Hopefully, you know, I can be under 15,000 on that reno. Uh, now the house is worth 70, $80,000 and I put a tenant inside of it and I'm cash flowing. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, most of my properties, since I own them outright, I don't have a mortgage or anything like that. Um, you know, we're cash flowing 600 bucks a month because our expenses are pretty low at that point. Great. I'm a, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of getting to a point where you own houses paid off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're going to trans your, your, your goal, what you're trying to do right now is you're trying to transition into multifamily. Correct. Yeah. Because honestly, man, buying the single family homes is very tedious work. Um, plus uncle Sam, uh, has really started liking me a lot, the more money I make. And so, if I don't have assets to depreciate, then um, unfortunately, I'm just paying more and more taxes, right? So buying the onesies and twosies houses is cool and all, but the downside is, man, it takes forever because inventory is so low and it has been ever since I've been in the business, right? I, I've, I haven't been in a buyer's market. I've been in a seller's market. So inventory is so low that um, it, it's tougher to find those deals. So I'm just, I haven't built a huge portfolio of single family houses. And I just thought, you know what, man, I'm going to go ahead and take all the capital that I have saved up currently. Um, I'm going to go invest that into something 
where I can buy a bunch of doors at one time. And, and that way I can get the, you know, principal pay down, depreciation, tax benefits, that whole thing on a, on a much bigger amount of houses at once. So that's, that's where I'm looking at multifamily or packages, you know, of how, uh, how, how big, a, how big a multifamily are you looking at? Like, cause obviously you have, and I know it's kind of going sideways here a little bit, but I'm curious. So I'm going to ask, um, sure. when, when people use the term multifamily, is that four, five, six units? Is that 10, 15, 20 plus? What are, what are you thinking? Yeah. So definitely, um, I'm hoping to, to, um, what I'm hoping to get is 20 plus units. So 20 to, you know, whatever. Uh, because at this point I've got, uh, I've got enough peers from being in all these different mastermind groups that I've paid for. I've got enough peers that, uh, if I can't take the deal down personally with my own capital, then, you know, I can just reach out to them and we can work on it together, pull, you know, syndicate money or whatever we need to do and, and be able to get into these bigger, deals. It's funny. Everything that you just said right now, I had this flashback to my buddy. Do you know who Steven Akindana is? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Makes me wonder if you guys are in the same uh, multifamily mastermind group. Oh, really? Nick, no, and man, G- I, Nick and Gino. Does that sound familiar? No. I don't know. No, I, I've, I, so I'm in uh, Tim Bratz's group. Okay. Um, he's a pretty big operator. Um, I think he's got like 4,000 plus units uh, right now. And, um, he, he, man, he racked up those units like in the last five years. So he went from zero to 4,000 in five years, man. So, um, no, it's just, I, I decided I need to think bigger, right? That That's what I told mm-hmm. you in the beginning. My mentality was too small in the beginning and even still is. Um, so I, I look at some of the other players in the industry as inspiration and say, all right, look, if they can do it, I can do it. Right. Mm-hmm. I just got to be able to think big enough to, um, get out of my comfort zone and invest whatever I need to invest, you know, talk to whoever I need to talk to, build relationships, uh, give of my time, my services, whatever, to be able to play on that level. Man, I need, I'm glad you said that because it makes me think like I've got like 30 some single family homes that I own and that's fantastic. Sure. But at the same time, it's like, man, how great would it be to have like a 50 to 75 unit, something like that? I mean, Absolutely. Well, and, and how much time did it take you to, to build a portfolio of 30 single family homes, right? You know, it's, it's funny because like you said, in hindsight, looking back, I, I started buying my first two properties towards the end of 2008. So, you know, call it 12 years. Here we are, 30 some homes. And, and for, the, for the new person here and when someone owns that many houses, it sounds like, oh, my God, it's, that's incredible. Honestly, I feel like I'm way behind. I feel yeah. like I should have bought... I mean, I, I really feel like I, as long as I've been doing this, I should own like a hundred single family homes. So in, in, in my mind, I'm not anywhere near where I want to be. But at the same time, it's like, I just can't imagine buying single family homes to that level. It's just, it, yeah, it's a lot. I mean, it's, I think it's just too much effort, right? I mean, there's, there's a point where you get to like diminishing returns because it's exhausting so is what it is. Day. It's exhausting. Yeah, man. I mean, think about it. You, you have to do the due diligence on, on 30 properties, right? And you've got to get your financing lined up on each one. You, you've got to talk to the sellers and get the, the contracts, you know, negotiated to a point where you want it. You got to do repairs on 30 properties. And, you know, that's why it takes years to build up your portfolios with single family. And so, yeah. um, exactly like you, man, I, I, I'm looking at folks that have been in the industry much, much longer than I have. And I don't want to look back and have those regrets and say, crap, man you know, I, I wish I would have had more units. And so that's where um, I just told myself, look, even if it takes me a year of solid searching to find my first multifamily, um, dude, that one year, if I can get, heck, let's just say I buy a 26 unit uh, uh, multifamily and it takes me a year to find it. Well, dude, it only took me a year to get 26 doors versus, you know, 10 years to get 26 doors. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. I can take whatever experience. Cause I know I'm going to bump my head along the way. Um, I'm not naive enough to think that I've got it all figured out just because I've done single family homes. Uh, it's going to be a completely new game. So I'm going to bump my head along the way. And then when the 46 unit or the 106 unit comes across my plate, it's going to be much easier um, to, to take a bite out of that. Love it, man. I love to hear that. And we can talk a lot about that, but what I want to do is I want to transition into kind of what the the topic of our 
uh, meetup tonight is, is, which is the top three strategies from starting, building, and scaling a real estate business. And what, and kind of what I'm saying, scaling a real estate business, it, you know, it's, it's not necessarily just wholesaling or just fixing and flipping or buying and holding, but maybe kind of more of the fundamentals, the fundamentals, uh, things that you have done that have helped you build your business. So, I'm going to kind of, I might jump in and ask a question here and there, but I'd love it if you would kind of take over and kind of run with this concept. And cause I'd love to hear what, what you think uh, the strategies are that have helped scale your business. Yeah, absolutely, man. So, and I will say this, if anybody has any questions whatsoever, um, please, you know, ask questions. I, I want it to be um, it, with Kurt's permission. I want it to be an open format to where if I say something that doesn't make sense or something that you need clarification on, you know, um, put it in the chat, uh, unmute yourself, ask whatever, just because um, I think it's important for people uh, to actually fully grasp because you're spending your time on, on this call for a reason. I want you to fully grasp what we're talking about here. Uh, so I want to do the best I can to clarify. So I can't see the chats, but um, Kurt, if you see anything pop up, just let me know. Sure. will. all right. So, um, you know, let's just get into what I feel like are the, the, the really key things when you're talking about building your real estate business. First off, my philosophy is when you start, you need to have a game plan before you just dive in and start doing something. But understand you got to be flexible enough that that game plan will change over time. Um, I started with the intent of doing wholesaling and that morphed over time into wholesaling, flipping houses, doing some turnkey stuff, you know, doing buy and holds and now in a multifamily. So a big key is if you want to build a business is you got to set up uh, the proper expectations. And um, some of those expectations need to be, it doesn't matter if it's real estate or owning a restaurant, you've got to have a structure to where any business can function in, right? So you need to have uh, accountability in the um, uh, department of um, employees, you need to have accountability in the department of finances. You need to have accountability in the department of uh, what is your growth strategy moving forward, marketing, so on and so forth. So you've got to treat your real estate business like a real business. Too many times I see people that I mentor, they come to me and they don't have any type of plan put together and they just see somebody wholesaling or see somebody flipping houses and say, hey, I want to do that without actually doing the research to figure out what does that even look like. So you need to actually understand that to run a real estate business effectively and to scale it and grow it, you've got to have um, the bones that any business should operate within. Okay. So you need to have a strategy on what does marketing look like? Because without marketing, nobody's going to know your name. You're not going to get any houses under contract and you're not going to be able to, to grow your business. So I believe that marketing should be the, the main thing early on that you invest into personally. Uh, I took every dollar that I made in my business and I, I stuck it right back into marketing. What, um, what, what kind of marketing? Sure. So early on, I did direct mail. Um, direct mail, I, I'm not big on right now just because of, of COVID and, and things like that going on. Now, I know some of the guys out there that are absolutely crushing it. Some of the, the, the guys and girls that I'm investor uh, in investor groups with, they're, they're crushing it with direct mail. We saw a decline in our direct mail. So again, that's one of the other key points is you got to pivot. When, when you see something like that happen, because otherwise you can go broke trying to um, beat your head against the wall and do the same thing. So um, we actually attack marketing on all channels, right? So like direct mail, uh, you can do bandit signs. You can, and that's a controversial topic, but you can do bandit signs. You can do flyers. Uh, you can do door knocking, cold calling, uh, pay-per-click with Google paid ads, search engine optimization, uh, TV ads, radio ads, um, uh, buying lists and cold calling those lists, texting those lists, doing ringless voicemail. Um, you know, there's any number of things that you can do. And I always recommend that somebody pick a marketing strategy, two marketing strategies that actually they're going to enjoy doing. So if you hate cold calling, don't pick cold calling as your marketing strategy. If you hate putting signs out, don't pick bandit signs. Um, I think everybody puts this emphasis on, man, this is the marketing strategy that you got to do. It's killing it. It's going to work. The reality is 
uh, you and I both know that there's investors doing every one of these marketing strategies and they're killing it, absolutely mm -hmm. making a, a, a ridiculous amount of money with it. The key is consistency, right? If you're going to go make your business model out of driving for dollars, you can't go drive for dollars on Tuesday and then pick it back up next Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, you have to go out every day and spend a minimum. So whatever marketing strategy that you're doing, I'm going to encourage you to spend a minimum of three hours a day doing it, especially early on. And, and that's three hours uninterrupted. So if you're going to cold call, you need to spend three hours every day on the phones doing nothing else. No Facebook, no Instagram, uh, no running errands for the wife or the husband, no taking care of the baby, whatever. You got to have religiously set aside three hours to make your phone calls or to go knock doors or you know to, to work on your online strategy or whatever you're going to do. Okay. So when it comes to marketing, um, personally, you, I, my strategy is you need to invest a minimum uh, of 30% of every dollar that you make in your business back into marketing. Okay. So three hours a day, 30%. That's a, it's kind of an easy thing to remember. Um, and there's no way, absolutely no way. And I would challenge anybody on this call. If you go out and you spend three hours every day, for the next 90 days, so that's three months, right? So I'm, I'm talking a lot of threes here, but I want this to be memorable for you. Three months, three hours a day, I promise you, you will have results. It's impossible for you not to. The, the, the thing that happens, I think, too much is that people um, don't understand how much work is really involved with finding these deals. Um, it's, it's grueling, man. Everybody out here is clamoring for the same houses to get under contract, right? Yeah. And so yes. that's, that's why you see these prices, you know, like you alluded to earlier, Kurt, the wholesalers are making sometimes more money than even the flipper is going to make because the supply and demand issue is there, right? You know, so, some of the stuff I've seen, it's some of the pricing that I'm seeing out there is so ridiculous that I, I think to myself, I can't, well, I think to myself one of two things, either they have the deal under contract at a good price, but they are trying to make an absolute killing that when I see the deal and the price that it's, it's just mind blowing. Or I think to myself, this person has no idea how to evaluate a home and they don't have a basic concept of following any type of formula to, because some of these prices, it's like, they're so high on the ARV. Their asking price is ridiculous. Their renovation putting is absolutely low. And yeah. I, this is just what I see every day. So one of the things I will say is, um, you know, again, it goes back to that supply and demand issue, right? So um, I like the second amendment. I, uh, I enjoy having uh, guns and I like shooting guns and I like, you know, that whole thing. I like cars. I like, you know, the typical guy stuff, right? So if you look in the gun world right now, uh, gun prices have increased significantly, uh, since COVID happened and the looting and the rioting and, you know, the, the election process and all that, uh, people are paying right now. They're complaining about it, but they're still buying it. They're buying guns for three times more than what they were a year ago. Same thing with silver prices. All right. So silver prices have shot through the roof and, and, you know, it's like uh 26 bucks an ounce when a year ago you bought it for 14 bucks an ounce. I was just going to say uh, 14. Yeah. Lumber prices, right? So uh, the the big rehab that I'm doing out in Millington, um, man, my, my porch cost me five grand in lumber alone, right? Because the prices have just shot through the roof. Now, the, the reality is though, I've got to build a house, so I'm still going to pay those prices. So flippers are facing that same thing where wholesalers are able to get much bigger spreads on some of these deals if they do a good job on the negotiation, right? Um, but, you know... It, it's one of those things that um, you got to educate yourself in your craft. You got to know what your after repair value is on the house. You got to understand what repairs are. Um, you mentioned a formula. I, I personally don't like, um, I don't like formulas just because formulas end up getting people in trouble a lot of times. Cause they'll, they'll uh, take a house like in Memphis. It's very hard in some areas, actually in most areas to run comparable sales and actually use a formula that will net you the right amount of money, um, especially in areas like Midtown or, you know, any, any area where there's gentrification going on. Mm -hmm. You know, you got over here on Jackson, uh, a house selling for $330,000. 
one street over on Agnes, you got a house selling for 40,000, right? So you, you got this trash heap of a house that somebody doesn't know what they're doing. They just look on their Zillow report or whatever. And they say, oh man, this house uh, is worth, you know, ARV of 310,000. They send it out and nobody's buying it and, and they wonder why. Well, it's because they don't understand fully what their business is. Your business is actually, you got to get very granular. You got to get out here in the streets and you got to understand what the home prices are from street to street. You can't just take a, you know, this formula that says, Hey, you know, just take a, an amalgamation of all the houses out there, condense it down to the median. And then there you go. There's your, your formula. Um, so I'm a proponent of actually getting out there and busting your butt and doing the work. So take, um, you know, take your, your repair estimates, right? A lot of wholesalers have no clue. You know, they put uh, 20,000 in repairs. You look at the house, it's a 1920 build uh, and, and it needs, you know, probably 80,000 in repairs. So I actually recommend people go out, find a contractor and go do some work for him for free. Go be his, his gopher for a week, tote his ladders and his hammers and, and go on jobs and, you know, be his, uh, be his coffee delivery guy or gal or whatever you need to do. So he, so he can give you some experience on what it actually looks like to be uh, in the field as a contractor. Um, same thing with buying houses. You need to act as if you're buying this house so you can uh, stop using a formula to come up with your after repair value and what you should send the deal out for. You need to work your numbers backwards, right? So every deal that we send out, we work the numbers backwards. This is what the house is worth. Subtract what the buyer is going to have to spend on a realtor. Subtract what the holding costs are. Subtract the closing costs. Subtract the repairs. And then subtract the profit. Then subtract your wholesale fee. That's how you come up with the value of what you should be asking for this house. But a lot of times people don't understand the business well enough and they just want to use a formula real quick, plug it in and send a deal out. So, um, you know, again, that goes back to your core business model needs to be to really sharpen your pencil and say, what do I need to do to separate myself from the other players, my, my peers uh, that are in the game? And, um, you know, I, 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 I can't stress that enough, but. Again, when you're running a business, you got to have something that separates you and you need to be thorough enough so that people take you seriously. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So you were talking about marketing, obviously, and I, and I kind of sidetracked you there sure. off a little bit, but um, kind of pick back, pick back up from marketing. Cause I know that marketing was one of the, the main fundamentals you're talking about in scaling your business. Where do you go from marketing? Um, so, I mean, Again, it's going to depend on what you want to do, right? So mm -hmm. um, you can do any marketing channel yourself or you can hire somebody to do it. And, and that's an internal decision you need to make. Um, so I personally don't like to do the work myself. I like to hire professionals that know what the heck they're doing much better than I do and pay them to do it for me because everything that I've tried to do myself in that arena, um, yeah, I'll have some success with it but I ultimately wind up disappointed because I'm not having as much success as I want to. So for my pay-per-click ads, I have a team that runs those for me. For my Facebook stuff, I have a team that runs that for me. For my Instagram, I have a team that runs that for me. For my um, uh, flyers that we do, I have a team that does that. For, uh, you know, radio and, and, you know, every channel that we're doing, cold callers, I, I have cold callers doing it. I'm not on the phone. It's just not the best use of my time to, to sit there and dial numbers anymore. Now, when I started out, it was absolutely the best use of my time. But at some point, you need to start trading your money for time. Early on, you need to trade your time for money. When did you, what was happening in your business when you were able to make that determination that you needed to make that transition to maybe give some of that control over to another team, whether it was virtual assistants, uh, doing cold calling or whatever? When did you make that decision? What was happening um, in your business? I actually made that decision when I was at a point where I didn't even feel like I could make that decision. Right. I, I thought, man, I don't have enough money to hire somebody. Uh, I don't know what to train them on. Um, you know, all those things were going through my head. But, you know, the, the people that I was in the mentorship groups with kept telling me, Dennis, look, you're holding yourself back by not investing in those things, by investing in hiring a VA investing in hiring a salesperson, investing into your uh, pay-per-click campaign or whatever marketing you're doing, you're going to put professionals 
that are actually segmented for that role that are going to do a much better job than you are. And your results are going to be much higher. So you're, you're essentially renting somebody else's talent and abilities um, by paying them either hourly or commission or whatever. You're renting their talent and abilities and, and you're going to grow more than you would if you kept it all to yourself. So I actually encourage people to um, get uncomfortable and make that hire, even if they don't feel like they should be making a hire quite yet. It's going to force you to work harder because once I started having people on payroll, I realized that it wasn't just me anymore. And I couldn't sit on the couch if I wanted to sit on the couch that day that I had to actually get out here and produce no matter what, because I had people depending on me. What are some of the mis- maybe mistakes or not the, the word that I wanted to use, but what are some of the obstacles that you faced when you started to experience success in, in, kind of growing pains? What are some of the obstacles that were coming up that you had to overcome? Um, man, they were so plentiful. Uh, even to this day, I mean, I still face lots of obstacles, right? So hiring people has been very tough. Um, I don't know if it's just the Memphis market or if, if it's, you know, kind of that way in general, but hiring people locally has been very hard. Um, yes. We've had lots of people that come on, on board and they end up uh, staying around just long enough to learn the systems and processes and so on and so forth. And then they go off and do their own thing. Right. So that has been a very hard thing, even to this day for me, which, uh, we actually just brought Tom on board, Tom Christensen. And that was a, a, a big move for me because I needed somebody that I could a count on and B that had clout in the industry. Um, because again, I need to hire people that are, uh, skilled at what they do. Tom has been in the business for 12 plus years, right? He's got a name for himself in the community. Um, so, so bringing people on, on the team was a very hard thing for me because a, I didn't know what to pay them. I didn't know how to pay them. I didn't know how to train them. I didn't know any of that. Um, so, so hiring people early on was a very hard thing for me to transition into. Um, knowing what to put my money into for marketing was a hard one because at that point I was only doing direct mail and it was working just fine. But then once direct mail started going down, because um, this is a little bit uh, into the transition phase when now everybody is online and, and starting YouTube uh, channels about how great direct mail is. Well, once word got out about how great direct mail is now everybody's doing it. So there's a, a decline in the effectiveness of it. You know, it's so funny. It, I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt you real quick. Yeah. We still do some direct mail. Yeah. And when these people call me, I, you know, I ask them, I'm like, how, how many other postcards have you received? And the answer is a ton. Yeah. And I always ask them, you know, what made you decide to call me? Like, like, why did you call me and not the 15 other cards you've gotten in the last 30 to 60 days? And it's odd. I think what it really just kind of comes down to is it's kind of luck of the draw. It's time. That's exactly right. It's it's, it's it. a lottery, brother. You're you won the lottery when that person calls you. That's it exactly is. what it's, it is. It's it's not because uh, the words on my card were just so much better, or my card was brighter, or fluorescent pink, or whatever. It was just it's a fluke. Yeah. That's all. It's I luck really of the draw, it's, man. It's a, yeah, luck of the draw. Yeah, I would go in houses and I would ask them the same thing. They would Excuse literally me. show me a stack of mail this thick. And, you know, they've got Google Street View postcards. They've got the bright pink ones. They've got zip mailers. They've got yellow letters. I mean, like they have a handful of everything. Right. And I'm like, I'm thinking I did something amazing in my letter. And they're just like, no, I mean, I just, you know, you were at the top of the stack and it was just kind of the right time. And so I just figured I would call. You know, um, what, you know what I have found that has been absolutely fascinating, though, in terms of direct mail? <laughs> I am shocked at how many people will call me just to ask me to take them off their mailing list. Sure. And I think to myself, you know, all the random junk mail that people get in the mail anyway, do they call those people and those companies to be like, I don't want to receive your Christmas shopper magazine anymore. Oh yeah. Dude, I had had ladies, old ladies telling me that they're going to call the FBI on me because I'm harassing them. Right. I mean, literally saying that they're going to call the FBI. And I was like, lady, listen, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to harass you, but are you calling Domino's pizza? Cause they're sending you flyers and telling them that that you're going to call the cops on them too. And the reality is, is that the reality is, is that no, we're not taking anybody off any list. Well, so, so I actually, um, I used to not, but Mm -hmm. now I do. 
And, and the reason why is because we live in a very litigious society and man, I don't want to get my pants suit off of me mm -hmm. because what I've found out, man, is when people look you up online and they see that you're mentoring people and that you drive a nice car and you live in a nice house and that you might have a little bit of money, they think, oh boy, I'm going to go sue that person, right? Here we go. Even if it's a baseless claim, it's still now you're tied up in court for years. So, um, man, we have a rule in our office. Like if this person says, remove me from your list, those magic words come out of their lips. We just instantly put them on the do not call list. And, um, I, I just don't, I personally don't want to deal with that. Now, early in my career, I will tell you, uh, that we thought, crap, man, I need to call anybody and everybody. So we're just going to keep calling them. Um, but you know, just, I personally, man, I love my family and I'm a pretty small guy. I don't want to go to jail. Uh, so I, uh, I just decide, you know, look, we're you know, it's interesting though, because when I ask them for their address, they, they'll call me up and they'll be like, I don't want to sell my house. And I want you to stop sending me postcards. And I'll ask yeah. them, I'm like, well, can you tell me the address so I can put you on the list? And it's like, I don't want to give you my address yeah. or you should know my address. You sent a card to me. It's like, I need That's not how it works, but yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> well, you know, and that actually brings up a kind of a point too. Like one of the things that you got to understand in this business, um, you've got to have really thick skin, right? I mean, oh, yeah. when I was making, I, I was making tons of cold calls every day <clears> and I was also receiving calls from direct mail and that sort of thing. Man, people will cuss you out. They'll give you death threats. They'll, they'll, you know, talk about your family. They'll do all kinds of stuff. So Understand that in this real estate business, you really need to have thick skin and not take things personally when, when people do that to you. That's why I love uh, text messaging because, man, the, yeah. the responses are very uh, colorful. Dude, I, like, I've received some downright nasty uh, stuff from text message. Um, it looked like we had a couple of uh, questions pop up in yeah, the chat. Here we go. We, yeah, and we got it. Okay, so uh, T Mac wanted to know which employees do you need? Oh, that's a T Mac. That's a very good question. And and look, um, I I will tell you this unequivocal unequivocally. The number one person you need to hire first is not an acquisitions manager, which is what most people will tell you. It's going to be a personal assistant slash office manager. That's the first person you need to hire. And the reason why that is, you are the best salesman or best saleswoman in your craft right now, or in your in your office right now. And so, while you're young in your business you need to actually focus on what's going to generate revenue income generating activities iga that's the only thing your time should be focused on right now so an assistant slash office manager is going to allow you to take all of your time and stop worrying about filling out contracts stop worrying about sending direct mail stop worrying about any of that stuff um and man my assistant like is it's a combined role like there is no that's not in my job description type of mentality. If I need her to do dry cleaning, take the dry cleaning up to the, the dry cleaners, or if I need her to send out, like she opens all my mail for me. She responds to my emails. She books my travel, like literally everything, even for my personal life, because I want to take everything off of my plate that does not make me any money because your, your time is too valuable to be spending on menial tasks. So the very first person you need to hire is somebody that's going to take all that junk off your plate so you can go focus on generating activity, uh, uh, generating revenue uh, in your business. Now, your wife is a real estate agent. Correct. How does that work in terms of you primarily deal with investment side of real estate? And I'm going to, I'm going to guess that she does more retail activity, correct? Well, actually, it was interestingly enough in 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 her early um, career as a real estate agent, she actually hated working with investors because she didn't understand like, you know, investors can be cocky sometimes and they just they're like, hey, let's go. You know, this is what I'm looking for. So she was very much relational and she loved the warm fuzzies of helping somebody move into their new home and that sort of thing. Well, over time, she's actually transitioned into um, a good blend of work and she loves working with investors now. Because she understands that it's very uh, formula based. There's no emotion in it. They, they're just like, look, if this is what I can find, then I'll buy it. Um, so at this point, we actually operate our business. And this goes back to your the, the fundamentals that we're talking about with scaling and, and growing your business. 
I actually treat Natasha's realtor side as if it's a whole separate business, right? So we, we kind of have this partition where if it's a cash offer, then that is, that comes to my side of the business. If it's a retail lead, then that'll go to her side of the business. So all of the marketing that I'm doing is actually benefiting both of us because, um, we do everything in house. If we talk to somebody and they say, Hey, look, you know, cash offer just doesn't make sense for me. Um, we don't just say, Oh man, okay, fooey. We lost out on that one. We immediately transition and say, Hey, you know what, Joe? Um, I fully understand that. Let me go ahead and connect you with our realtor. She's one of the top in Keller Williams, so on and so forth. Uh, she'll be able to get you as much money as you possibly can get for that house. And she'll make the process super easy for you, yada, yada, yada. So we have a no lead left behind strategy to where no matter what they want, we're going to be able to service that client if if they'll allow us to, to earn their business. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um... And I personally will not be a licensed agent. People ask me that all the time. Uh, Dennis, should I get my license if I'm primarily wholesaling or, or whatever? I would say no. Um, the, yes, you can save some money by not having an agent. Uh, or, you know, you're going to pay 3%, 6%, whatever you work out with an agent. Um, you're going to pay them whatever to market your properties for you that you sell on, on, uh, on the market. But the reality is the, fiduciary responsibility that you have to your client as a realtor and all the red tape that comes along with it. Um, it, it's man, in my opinion, it's just not worth it to have that risk on your head. Um, you've got to have all these disclosures and also realtors. Um, if there's any realtors on the call, you'll know that this is true. I work with them every day can be very petty. And so they'll report you for just about anything and everything. Uh, and plus most realtors think that wholesaling is illegal because they're ignorant of, of the facts. So, um, I just don't think it's worth it personally. I hear you. And like I said, maybe, probably not from a wholesaling standpoint. Now, if somebody was doing fix and flips and things Correct. like that, you know, it, it would be more beneficial to do that. But I, I agree from a wholesaling standpoint, it's not really necessary. Yep. Absolutely. hundred uh, percent. And we're going to, we're kind of going to kind of, we're rounding the corner here. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll kind of finish up here real soon. Just wanted to ask you um, the time that you've been in real estate and, you know, you've, you, a lot of things have been happening that are wonderful for you. You've got success, you've got buying holds, your, your wholesaling deals, things are great. What from a personal standpoint, what has real estate done for you and your family? Um, that's a very good question. So man, real estate has made it to where um, I actually have, real financial freedom. And, and I know that kind of term is really flippantly thrown around, but for the first time in my life, I actually have the ability to go do what I want when I want. Um, I have a child that we just had, uh, my previous child that I had 12 years ago, I didn't have the same freedoms, right? I, I, I get to enjoy, like I told you, man, I have not been to my office maybe twice in the last month. Um, and I'm not worried about money. I have money coming in from my rentals and from our wholesaling and flipping business. Uh, a lot of that runs on autopilot. I just kind of oversee the day-to-day -day operations. Um, and, and so I can travel whenever I want to, I can spend time with my family. I'm a homebody. Um, and so I like being here with, with my kiddo. I mean, actually it's, it's like fulfilling to me to, to spend that time with, with my children. Um, I can bless my family, uh, my local church. I, I like to do a lot of work there. Um, it's allowed me to build a life that I actually enjoy living versus waking up every day, being upset because I've got to go do something for somebody else that I hate doing. Uh, I've been able to build in, in that four year time span. My net worth has, uh, you know, went from $0 to over a million dollars. I own cash flowing properties. I know how to flip houses. Now, uh, it allowed me to, uh, buy an airplane. It allowed me to buy my, one of my dream cars, um, you know, that's right. You like, fly those little planes, don't you? Yeah, man, you're crazy, man. Look, I, so interestingly enough, I'm, I'm scared of heights, man. So, um, me too. I'm a land lover. It's different when you're, when you're in control, right? That's the big difference. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, man, the reality is I grew up in a trailer house in East Texas where, you know, if we wanted, if we went out to, to eat, which was rare, um, you know, I couldn't really get cheese on my hamburger a lot of times because the money just wasn't there. Mm. Right. Um, I didn't have options as a kid that I do now as, as an adult. And, you know, uh, 
man, I'm 32 years old, right? It's, it's something that not a lot of people can say that they have financial freedom at 32 years old. Um, so real estate, man, is, is really changed my life. It genuinely has, but it's taken. So, so, you know, if you backtrack a little bit though, from the time I was 21 years old, became an entrepreneur at 21 to the age of 32. So for, for 11 years now, I've been grinding it out. When I say grinding out, bro, I mean like every day, seven days a week, except from the time that I'm at church. But from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed, it doesn't stop answering emails, phone calls, mentoring people, going to mentorships, buying houses, uh, you know, getting the crap beat out of me in, in, in negotiations and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, it has not been an easy journey, but it has been a very fun journey. And now it's allowed me to transition into bigger things. Right. So personally, man, real estate has absolutely changed my life. It really has. Where do you hope to see yourself in maybe the next few years, two to five years? Do you have a plan? Where do you hope you, where do you want to be? Yeah, that's a good question, man. Um, Loaded question, of course. Honestly, at this point, it's not even, it used to be a monetary thing. Like the first thing that would have popped in my head was a, like a a number. And now at this point, it's not a number. Um, It's more of like life goals, right? Um, Man, I want to actually learn how to dance in the next uh, five years. I want to learn how to play Break dancing? No, bro. My my wife, my wife has, uh, you know, she she is... um, She's ethnically diverse and I am not. And so uh, it's intimidating because she knows how to dance really well. And I want to be able to dance with her and my daughter. Listen, um, dude, here, here, here's my advice for you on that side note here. Get yourself a copy of um, Dirty Dancing. Okay. And Dirty Dancing 2 Havana Nights. Swayze that's it up. That's all you need, dude. Boom. That's, that's it. it, right? That's the, it. the problem is the way Swayze and I are built are just a little bit different. <laughs> Right. So I think he got, he had that going for him. Um, but yeah, man, the reality is I want to learn to play piano in that time frame. I want to spend a bunch of time with my kids. I want to go travel places. Um, I'd love to own several hundred multifamily units by that point. You know, um, it's what you said is sticking out to me from, from when I asked you this first question, because it, it it's you, kind of the point where you're at now and where at least where I'm at now, it's not, it's not monetary. I know that when I first got it, you know, and and I hate to use the term broke, but when people are broke or they're not where they're at financially and, you know, it's like, it's always centered around the money. Absolutely. It's like, I don't care what it is. It's, it's, it's money, 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 money. You know, it, it, it goes from money, money, money to, oh, I need my Rolex watch. Or here's my cool car. And don't get me wrong. Those things are great. And if those are goals that'll motivate somebody to, to make them better, fantastic. But it's like you get to a point where, like you said, it's, it's, I want to, I want to have a vacation home and I want to travel and I want to be able to provide this for my family and community and, and, and all these things. It's, it's, it, it, the money is not what you're focused on anymore. That's, that's awesome to hear. Yeah, man. You know, again, for me, so like legacy is a big, big deal for me. Um, I, I don't want my kids to understand what I did growing up where you're optionless, right? Now I want them to understand what hard work is. And my kids are, are not just going to have stuff handed to them. They're going to work for it. Um, but man, when you don't have options, um, your, uh, your character gets tested a lot, man. When I, when I first started off as a business person, I found myself with this dichotomy that I was going through where like, I feel like morally and ethically I'm a sound individual uh, and I love the Lord. And so, you know, I have that part of it, but man, I was always faced with a decision of, man, like I could make more money if I did this, but if I did that, that's kind of like toeing the line of, you know, the moral high ground. So I guess what I'm saying is, man, I don't want my kids to really have to understand what that's like. I want them to understand hard work and I want to leave a legacy for them. You know, the scripture tells us uh, in the book of Proverbs that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children's children. And that's three generations, man. If I don't have enough money for gas, which for a, a very big part of my adult life, I, I didn't have enough money for gas. Right. If I don't mm-hmm. have enough money for gas to go on an appointment, how am I going to leave anything behind for my great grandchildren? <clears throat> so um, that goes ties back into building, growing and scaling your real estate business is the first thing that you need to start out with is, is why are you doing this? And it, and it can be, 
you know, on, on your vision board, which I encourage everybody to have a vision board so you can look at your goals every day and find out what do you want. Um, the car that was on my vision board, I have it in my garage right now. The house that was on my vision board, I'm living in it. Um, the, uh, the, the other, you know, the trips that I wanted to do, I've done them. And so now at this point, uh, since I've got that out of the way and I realized, huh, that's cool, but it, it didn't define me. Um, now I'm wanting to have life experiences where I'm actually blessing other people and, and helping them live out their life to the fullest. And also I want to do that for my children. So there's a book, start, there, there's a book that you should get. It's called, or you should read it. Maybe you have already. It's called the ultimate gift. I haven't, I haven't read that. You should. Ultimate gift. It's, okay. It, it, it's it's, it's, it's about everything you just said. I love it. I love it, man. So yeah, having your vision before you, I think is huge. So before you form your LLC, before you, you set your business bank account up and, and any of that, I think you need to have a clear understanding of what's going to motivate you to get out of bed when the title work comes back on that house and you figure out, oh, guess what? I was about to make 20 grand and now that's, that's done for because the deal can't close. Or when you have a seller back out because somebody else comes in and offers them more money or when somebody sues you or when a contractor screws you over or whatever, those things are very real and you, you need to have something that's going to wake you up every day where you, you have that vigor to, to attack it and, um, and, and really just go after it with gusto, man. So um, let me hit on a couple of those key points. And then uh, I think there was a few, few more questions that we have to answer. So building your business. First thing, um, have a vision, understand why you're doing what you're doing. Second thing is have a plan to the best of your ability. Just even if it's rudimentary, just say, hey, look, my first thing that I'm going to do is is do some marketing, whether that's direct mail, pay-per-click, door knocking, cold calling, whatever. Uh, have a game plan for your marketing. Third thing is you need to make sure that you are honing your craft every day. Listen to podcasts, uh, watch videos on real estate, read books on real estate. You need to be doing that every single day relentlessly. Uh, third thing is you need to embrace failure, um, because you are going to fail a lot. Failure is not a bad word. Um, and it should be something that you celebrate because the more times that you fail, it means that your, your success is, uh, coming right around the corner. Um, the next point I will make is you want to get with people that are like-minded and get away from people that are not like-minded, meaning a lot of people in my family were telling me, Dennis, don't do that. That's a scam. Dennis, don't do that. You're going to lose a bunch of money. Dennis, don't do that. That's scary. I got away from people with limiting beliefs, which meant my friends and my family circle went a lot smaller. But I could not have that negativity in my mind impacting me because their limiting beliefs were, were starting to make me feel like, man, you know what? They might be right. Man, you know what? This, oh, crap. Today, I just got beat up by this seller, so I probably should tuck my tail and go home and, and go you know, get a regular job. So get away from people with the negative beliefs. Get with people that have positive beliefs. So surround yourself with people like that are on this call. Join real estate groups. Do whatever it takes. Get out of your comfort zone. Um, and then get a mentor or a partner, somebody that has sufficient experience and knowledge in the industry to actually help guide you along because you're going to make a lot more money by getting with somebody that can do that for you versus trying to do it on your own. Think of this, any paid profession that you can think of where people make tons of money, doctor, lawyer, scientist, whatever, do they start their career off by saying, hey, you know what? I'm just gonna start handing some cards out and ask people if I can do surgery on them. Or ask people, hey, uh, I heard you might be having a fight with your neighbor, can I, um, you know, I'm not really a lawyer, but I'm, I'm looking to be one, can I represent you in court? That would never work. So the same, I look at it the same way within your real estate practice. You need to have somebody that can really teach you how to do this thing the right way. Um, and then the other, other side to that is, so that's, that's your building phase. Then your growing phase needs to be um, hiring your first person, which I believe should be a personal assistant slash office manager type of role. Second person should be acquisitions. So this is now you know, uh, kind of blending scaling and, and building at the same time, uh, setting aside your money for taxes, understanding the, uh, the way that your business works. So that's still part of that building phase. So you need to really immerse yourself in your craft and understand every aspect of it. Um, as you're building, you need to, uh, get the right people, uh, 
uh, on the team, not only as employees, but also your attorney. So you need to build a power team. You need a good closing attorney. You need a good, um, I would say even just a, a regular attorney. Uh, uh, you need a, a good um, realtor on your team. You need somebody that can help you with creative financing stuff. You need a good lender on the team, two lenders. You need a, a hard money lender, three lenders. You need hard money lenders, private money lenders. You need institutional lenders. Um, and then who else is on your power team? Um, credit repair specialists, move out specialists, people that can, can, you know, get that hoarder house cleaned out for you. Um, if you're not, if you don't have a buyer's list built up yet, then get with somebody that has a massive buyer's list and split deals with them. But, um, you know, those are some, some key people that you need to have on your power team. And then scaling is kind of really, I think the scariest part, because that's when you're comfortable because everything's going the way that you want it. But now you've got to really branch out into the unknown and start doing a lot different marketing channels. You got to start investing a ton of money back into your craft. Um, you, you need to hire more people and uh, expand maybe into different marketplaces. So um, there's lots of things to tackle there, but I would say start with the end in mind. Don't take other people's success uh, and make it uh, to where it allows you to feel like you're not enough because that's very easy to do with social media. You see people posting these big checks and, and how many deals they're doing. Uh, volume is fine, but just I would say don't really look at volume. I would say look at dollar amount because really the ultimate goal of a business is to be profitable. You're supposed to generate revenue, not do X amount of deals. So start with your revenue goal in mind and then understand what it's going to take to do that. If you want to net, you know, a hundred thousand dollars this year, well, start deconstructing that. If your average assignment fee is $10,000, how many deals do you need to do? If you're going to pay 20% in taxes, plus your 30% in marketing costs. And, you know, for me, 10% in tithe, how many deals do you need to do if you're going to subtract 50% of your income to actually make that hundred thousand dollars? So if you want to make a million dollars, same thing, just, just work backwards from it. So that's part of building, growing and scaling your real estate business is, is starting with the end in mind and, and not worrying about as many deals, but more the revenue side. That's awesome, man. And, uh, you know, like I said, a lot, I don't think a lot of people do start with the end of mind. A lot of people will think they, they're, they're starting with 